resulted in a new church that began preaching the gospel. During that time, a man named Epaphras was deeply impacted by the gospel and resolved to take it back to his hometown. He was from Colossae. Epaphras returned to his hometown and in faith began the hard work of planting the Colossian church. In AD 62, Epaphras visited Rome where Paul was imprisoned. He shared with Paul the news of a strange teaching that was rising up and threatening the health and vitality of the Colossian church. The Colossians were being enticed away from the gospel through forms of asceticism and the worship of angels. In other words, they were being taught that Jesus wasn't enough. They were being distracted with man-made religion. They were drifting with the tide of their culture. They were buying into the false hope that the Roman Empire would offer them ultimate comfort and security. Although Paul had never been there, he was deeply concerned out of his great love for the people of this church. Therefore, he set out to write a pastoral letter from prison that would remind them that God had already accepted them by virtue of their connection and identity with Christ alone. What those in the church at Colossae needed to be taught and reminded of then, we need just as much today. In the face of opposition, distractions, and false teaching, we are to stand in Christ against the flow. The book of Colossians was written 2,000 years ago. It's a short book found in the New Testament. It's where we will be studying the next several weeks together. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I'll invite you to turn to the book of Colossians. It was written by the Apostle Paul while he was under house arrest in Rome. And Paul hadn't been to Colossae, the city, he had been to Ephesus, starting a church in the port city of Ephesus. And Ephesus has such a, a large piece of the pie in the New Testament. Ephesus and Jerusalem are the two major cities that are talked about the most. Uh, but as that video just shared, uh, someone that was in the Ephesus church took the gospel to Colossae, started a house church in Colossae, it grows but then it falls into error, falls into heresy. And so Paul, who's in Rome, has such a heart for these new Christians in Colossae, he writes this letter, what we call an epistle, to correct their errors. And it's really a letter that goes against the flow of what the culture was saying. While Paul was writing the letter to the Colossians, he was also writing a letter to the Ephesians. So you can imagine Paul in his, uh, his kind of like jail environment. So he's writing two letters at the same time. And you'll, you'll see this if you read this this week. Read Colossians chapter 1 and then read Ephesians chapter 1 and you'll see a lot of overlap, a lot of similarities because Paul has Ephesians on his mind as he's writing to the Colossians. Colossae was one of seven major cities in Asia Minor, the seven cities of Revelation. They get talked about at the beginning of Revelation. And a problem arises in Colossae. The problem, in a nutshell, is this. Some, some teachers arise within and they preach big religion, little Jesus. Big religion. So they're huge on religious festivals, certain high holy days, uh, asceticism, which is keeping things from your body. So huge on religion. Do this. Don't do that. But they are about a little Jesus. They de-emphasize Jesus and they inflate religion. And so this is known as the Colossian heresy because they believe that Jesus is a created being. They have this idea that there's God and there's humanity and then somewhere in the middle is something called emanations from God. And these emanations are usually angels, messengers from God. And so they take Jesus and they put him in the middle with the emanations, and they say Jesus is a created being. He must be a messenger, an angel from God. And so they 
take away Jesus' deity and, and, and bring him down to a created being. He's not divine. He's not human. He's something in between. He's this emanation. And so what we're going to see today in Colossians chapter 1 is that Paul wants to correct this error. He wants to correct this heresy that's erupted in the church of big religion, little Jesus, by emphasizing how big Jesus really is. He's going to emphasize the supremacy of Christ in all things. This is who Jesus really is. He's not an angel. He's not a created being. He is God on the throne, the one that we worship. And in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul just dives right in and he says that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And you can circle those words, beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Paul is going to take chapter 1 of Colossians today, and he's just going to unpack for us all about the beloved Son of God, Jesus Christ. And as I was reading through this passage this week, I saw Paul identifying 10 things about Jesus, 10 takeaways from Colossians chapter 1 that, that make a big Jesus with little religion. So if you're taking notes, if you're typing things into your phone, you use number one to 10 as we go through Colossians chapter one together. You ready? Yeah. All right. The first thing that Paul says is found in verse 15. In fact, you can separate it into verse 15a. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That word image means copy or exact reproduction. In the book of Hebrews, you get this echo of what Paul is saying to the Colossians. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says that he is the radiance of, of the glory of God, the exact imprint or the exact representation of his nature. Jesus is the exact representation, the exact character. The Greek word there is character. And what that means is uh, in the Greek culture, they would create coins that would go into circulation for spending money. It would have the Roman emperor stamped on the coin and they would take wet clay and stamp it. It was stamped by the original coin so that the new coin was an exact rep representation, an exact image of the original coin. That's the character. And Paul says this character this is the image. Jesus is the character of God. He is the exact representation of God. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. In the book of John, chapter 14, verses 8 through 9, one of the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And so to observe Jesus is to observe God in action. This is the beloved son, the exact representation the exact character of God. Number two, Colossians 1.15b, the second half of that verse, says that Jesus is the firstborn 
of all creation. Now, now these teachers that arose in Colossae would say, aha, there it is, right there. He is created. He is the firstborn. So he was created by God. And the word firstborn is used twice in the first chapter of Colossians. This is the first of two times that it's used. In Hebrew culture, firstborn was not taken literally. It was an idiom. It was a title of preeminence, to be first in line. The, the person who runs the household is the firstborn. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 89, verse 27, it says this about David, King David. And I will make him, David, the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, was David literally the firstborn? No. He wasn't even the firstborn in his own family. He was the last in a long line of brothers. He wasn't the first king. Saul was the first king. Instead, this is a title. This is a, a figure of speech. It would be like um, saying that this guy is the top dog of the organization. Or he's kind of in charge. This is the guy that's in charge of this group of people. It's a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. And Paul says that Jesus, this Jesus is the top dog. He's in charge. He is the firstborn. He comes first. Not created, but as we'll see, creator. This is number three in Colossians chapter one. Paul says, for by him, by Jesus... All things were created. So he's saying Jesus is not a created being. He's creator. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus. Paul is emphasizing that Jesus is not like an angel that was created by God, that represents God to us. But no, Jesus is God in human flesh. In John chapter 1, verse 3, we have a, an overlap passage. John 1, 3 says, all things, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus was intricately involved in the creation of all things, both visible, invisible, rulers, dominions, everything. Is Jesus created? No, he's creator. The fourth thing that Paul talks about in Colossians 1 is found in verse 16b. That all things were created for him. You exist for him. You have a purpose in that you exist for him. This is why Jesus came to fight for you. You are his inheritance. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, these words, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You are so valuable because you are Christ's inheritance. That's why he came to fight for you. You were created for him, by him. And then it says, number five, in verse 17, that Jesus is before all things, echoing that he's the firstborn. He is first in line. He comes first. He is before all things. And this is true in terms of time, in terms of sequence. That Jesus is immortal. He has no beginning. So he is before all of us. He is before all things. 
that if you were to look into eternity past, you would see Christ. He's always been there. He's before all things. Jesus shared this in John chapter 8, verses 56 through 59. Jesus was talking to a crowd at the temple, and he said, Your father Abraham, now Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus, but your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it, and he was glad. So the Jews said to Jesus, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why were they going to throw stones at Jesus? Because he said, I am. He used the Old Testament name of God, Yahweh. I am, he said, I am Yahweh. I am the immortal, eternal God. I saw Abraham. I formed Abraham in his womb. I have always existed. He was making a claim to divinity. And so they were going to throw stones to kill him because they thought that was blasphemy, especially in the temple. He was making this claim to divinity. But Jesus truly is before all things. He's not a created being who entered into time and space at, at a point in history. Jesus is outside of history. He is massive. Paul goes on. The sixth thing he teaches is in verse 17b. He says, and in him, in Christ, all things hold together. <clears throat> Jesus is the cosmic glue that holds galaxies and planets and worlds together. The reason why our molecules don't go flying off into space is because Jesus is holding all things together. Together, There's a parallel passage in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. By the word of his power. Jesus simply speaks and the cosmos is held together. That's how powerful he is. On the night of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is hanging out in the darkness with some of his disciples, and then a mob, a, a Roman legion, shows up, soldiers ready to handcuff Jesus. And they say, are you him? And Jesus says, I am. And then what does it say in the scriptures? That all the soldiers fell backwards because of the power of his word. And with that, Jesus is able to hold all things together. This is how powerful Jesus is. Paul goes on and gives a seventh reason why Jesus is so big. Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the head. He is the master, the leader. He is above all. He's not simply a pastor. He's not simply a committee in the church. No, Jesus is above all of the church members. Jesus rules every church. It's his body, and he is the head. The head controls the body. So Jesus is powerfully in control of all things. 
Paul goes on in Colossians 1.18b and says that he is the beginning, the firstborn. There's that word again. The firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. And that title, firstborn from the dead, you might circle that. That's a title that is given to Christ alone because only Jesus has tasted death and then been resurrected. That makes him the firstborn from the dead. He is preeminent over the domain of death and resurrection. He rules over that domain. He has absolute control over death and our future resurrection. In John chapter 5, verses 25 through 26, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son also to have life in himself. Jesus is preeminent. He is massively in control over the domains of death and resurrection. This is why we don't need to fear death. Because Jesus is in control control. He is the master. The voice of the Son of God will call out to raise up the dead to new life. That's the promise of the gospel. Paul goes on. He gives a ninth reason why Jesus is to be big in our imaginations, big in our worship, Colossians 1.19, Paul says, For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The fullness of God. Think about that word. The fullness of God. The full weight of deity. Later in Colossians 2.9, Paul will say, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So everything that makes God God exists in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is important because the person of Christ goes with the work of Christ. If you take away from the person of Christ, then it takes away from the work of Christ. These false teachers in Colossae were taking away from the person of Christ. They were lowering Christ, saying he's just an angel, he's just a created being, but that would take away from the work on the cross of Christ. So Paul says, no, no, elevate Christ and then whatever you imagine him to be inflate it larger for all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in the person of Jesus Christ we cannot diminish the person of Christ without diminishing the work of Christ and finally the tenth and final aspect that Paul writes, is in Colossians 1, verses 20 through 22. He wraps up this section by saying, and through him, through Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death 
in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is the message of Christ, reconciliation, to take two parties that were ripped apart and to bring healing, to bring reconciliation. Humanity and God were ripped apart by sin, but Christ on the cross is the sacrifice that brings the two parties back together. And because we have reconciliation with God through Christ, we can have reconciliation horizontally with other people. Relationships that were ripped apart and ruined by sin can be healed and brought back together through Christ. And it's only because Christ is so massive, preeminent, and big. And religion is such a small, tiny thing. That's Paul's heart in Colossians chapter 1. To say, don't get this wrong. Go against the flow of what these teachers are saying in Colossae. Dare to trust in the gospel, the massive power of Jesus Christ at work in and through you to reconcile with others. This week, I want to encourage you to find a Bible that you can understand and read Colossians chapter 1 on your own. It only takes five minutes. And then if you want extra credit, like I said earlier, read through Ephesians 1 and compare how Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 kind of overflow together. And by reading through these passages, see what God might do through you. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for the scriptures that paint for us a beautiful portrait of your son, Jesus. Whatever we imagine of Christ, Lord, would you multiply it by 10 in our hearts and minds? For Jesus is big and powerful. He is preeminent. In him, all the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. And it's to him that we worship today. It's to him that we give our tithes and offerings. It's to him that we celebrate new beginnings, forgiveness, freshness of life. Because he was glad to die on the cross for our sins. And then to be raised up over the domain of death, ushering in an age of resurrection. God, use this series of talks these next several weeks from Colossians to engage our hearts and minds that we might more deeply and intimately follow you and trust you. <clears throat> As we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.